The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the April edition of Digging Into the BI. This is where members of better, the Better Investing community from Maryland, D.C., and Virginia get together, look at the latest issue of the Better Investing magazine and the website, and start to be able to present some of the stocks that we've seen that are interesting. So tonight we're going to look at Lulu, Lululemon Athletic. Athletica, uh, Micron Technologies, Enphase Energy, and Walgreens Boots Alliance. So a nice wide range of stuff. So let's go to our next slide. So our, this is our standard disclaimer throughout the better investing community. We're doing this for educational purposes. If we happen to show any uh, resources outside of the better investing community, it's not an endorsement or recommendation. Um, we believe, as all investors, you should be able to conduct your own review and research of any stocks you want to buy. We will try to tell you of stocks that, uh, that we're talking about that we own or our clubs own. And uh, they may be in our personal portfolio or, like I said, in the club portfolios. And again, we're not trying to endorse anything uh, or any other product. So we will record this. It will go up on our YouTube page, hopefully later on tonight. You never know. I may be watching the NCAAs instead. Anyway, next slide. So for those people that don't know who we are, um, who Better Investing is, we, this is a, a good place to come and see. Everything in these slides, when you see that blue underline, it means it's a hyperlink. So when you download the slides, you can go exactly to those locations. But we're an investment education organization. Uh, we focus on long-term fundamental investing. And all of us that are presenting tonight are volunteers. None of us are financial professionals. We do this because we think this is fun. So we're glad to have you with us. Next slide. And again, just a reminder, we are investment education. We believe involves learn by doing. Those are the two people that were there at the beginning. George Nicholson on the right and Tom O'Hare on the left. Glad you're here with us and we will show you how we do it. Let's go to our next slide. Here again is that YouTube channel I talked about. Again, there's that underline. So if you have the download, you downloaded the handouts, you can click on that and we'll go straight to that location. Um, do us a favor, since you're getting this free education program, we ask for you to like this video when you get on YouTube. Uh, you can share it and make sure to subscribe because that's how the algorithm works. We're trying to get up to 100 subscribers. We have 82 right now. We're creeping along and we'd like to do it. All of the webinars that are up there are organized into what are called chapters, which means you can just advance forward to the next stock. If you want to look at one, one of the stocks in particular and you're not necessarily interested in the others. So that's a way to be able to do that. Next slide. Again, for people that are new to uh, go to webinar, although looking at this list, we seem to have a lot of regulars here. Uh, but again, the, the sort of grayish blackish thing on the right hand side is your control panel and you can move that out, expand it or collapse it where that white arrow is with sort of the reddish orange background. If you want to, you can grab it where I have the green circles and you can move that control panel out of your way. It starts as defaults in the upper right, but you can move it to the lower right or over on the left hand side, what have you. If you do want to be able to ask questions, you can, if you see where that blue uh, sort of square is, um, pull that out. Uh, it's easier to type and you can be able to leave out, leave your questions. We have uh, people looking at that. We will have questions uh, at the end of all the presentations. And then you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you at that time. So again, glad to have you. Next slide. Uh, again, for people that are relatively new, and we even had one of our, our presenters tonight have a little bit of trouble with uh, their audio, uh, but uh, you if you're on your computer, you should be on computer audio. If you're having trouble, the red line arrow takes you to the help. Um, most people, if like I said, if you're on your computer, will be on computer audio, but you can also listen to us on your phone while looking at it on your computer. Uh, make sure to download those handouts. That green arrow takes you over there. There's four completed SSGs, and there is the slide deck for tonight. Again, all of them have the hyperlinks in that PDF there. Next slide. Again, for people that uh, are relatively new to this, you can make this uh, image even bigger. 
if you look at where I have that sort of red uh, rectangle, you can be able to sit there and make this even bigger where the one is. Uh, you can get it to full screen. If you want to capture an image um, to be able to help remind you of something, you can click on the second one. It usually defaults on a PC unless you've changed it somewhere else to your desktop. But regardless, you can be able to use these things to make your viewing experience even better. Next slide. So why are we doing this? Well, we would like to be able to show you the benefits of the Better Investing uh, subscription. You can get a free 90-day trial, uh, and that hyperlink up there will take it to you. Uh, you'll be able to see some of the resources and ideas. We want to be able to, we're focusing on people that are either new or uh, are uncertain of their judgments, and they want to see how uh, people that are actually experienced using the stock selection guide will uh, complete their judgments and thoughts. And we're trying to do the best practices. This is a combination between the Maryland and the DC regional chapter and our three model clubs. This is a great way to feature your club. In fact, that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, we have Washington uh, Metro Investment Club here to join along with the model clubs. And it's a way to be connected again to the mid-Atlantic region. So we're glad to have you. Next slide. So in just over an hour, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. We're going to have four completed stocks. We always do the um, monthly stock to study and the monthly undervalued feature. To see those, you have to be a member. Most of the stuff previous to this on these slides, anyone can get to. We also then try to find stuff from either the website or the magazine, personal experience for the other two stocks. Tonight, we're going to be looking at stocks that are featured out of the BI Top 100. Um, so that we just really want to be able to show you all the resources and all the stock ideas that you get as part of your uh, subscription membership into Better Investing. There are a lot of other great resources that we all use, but we're just trying to show you exclusively what you can get with your BI membership. Next slide. For those people that don't know, and again, you don't have to be a member to see this, is that you can be able to see the announcements. They're usually about six weeks in advance on what uh, the stock to study and undervalued feature is. So Lululemon and um, um, Walgreens were announced at the end of January, and here we are the first couple days of April. Um, and so that's a, a long time in advance. Um, so they already have those things there. Again, that hyperlink will take it to you. It's a great way to sort of look at this, and you can even practice in advance if you want to. Next slide. So the other thing we want to talk to you about is make sure that you are connected for future announcements, both from the chapter and from headquarters. So what you do is you'd go over into the My Account, where Cheryl is showing you with the red circle, and that will pull out the stuff that's sort of over on the left-hand side, where you have My Account, and you can see all that information. And the place you'd go to is your email and product subscription information, where the green circle is. And then if you go back over to the right-hand side, that green screen capture is what comes on out. If you go where that arrow is, you can be able to sit there and get all the local chapter news. If you're in Maryland, with the exception of Montgomery County, you'll get the Maryland chapter news. And if you're in Montgomery County, D.C., or the state of Virginia, you'll get the D.C. regional. And if you're from outside that area, we're glad, outside those two states in the district, we're glad to have you. Uh, this is free for everyone. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to show you um, what, how to use your BI membership. And if you're just poking around, we're glad to have you. But before you hit that save changes down in the right, um, that circle there, let's go to the next slide and we can show you some other things to get. And that would be the BI weekly newsletter. This you have to be a member for. It comes out from headquarters, but it focuses on a lot of the national education, what we call the ticker talk and stock up stuff from first cut stock ideas. It comes out around the close of business on Thursday. If you signed up for it and you're not getting it, check your spam filter. But there's always some good ideas. So now there's this time they're showing you the top 40 companies held by investment clubs. And also another thing on how to be able to, uh, whether your, your stock prices are updated automatically. So a lot of great resources there. They're all hyperlinked back to stuff with your membership. So just a way to be able to make the best use of your membership. Next slide. We're also up on Facebook, and I saw we had a really nice traffic uh, of people over on Facebook. 
that came through sharing it with other chapters. Thank you if you were one of the people who did that. We have both the D.C. Regional and the Maryland chapter. Again, the great thing about this is you do not have to be a BI member to see this stuff, and we can be able to reach out to people in our community in this area that we'd like to do. The, the, the targets, on, the tags on that are designed to be able to help us find people in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. So, next slide. Um, Jonathan, why don't you tell us what you guys are doing in the Maryland chapter? Sure enough, um, the Maryland chapter will be hosting an in-person uh, stock analysis class, uh, a stock study group, uh, a SSG class um, uh, at the College of Southern Maryland, and that starts next week, April 13th. So you can go to our webpage on the Better Investing website and get more details. Um, regarding the class and uh, registration information. Kevin, can you address uh, where the handouts are? Again, we're getting a lot of questions regarding the handouts and uh, individuals are able to see the, the control panel, I believe. Yeah, so the control panel, can we go back to, what is it, slide six or seven, somewhere it's around seven. there? seven. Seven, thank you. Seven. Yeah, let's uh, so let's go back to there it is. So this is your control panel. If you see, um, let's go back one more slide to six. So over on the right hand side, you see this grayish blackish thing. That's called your control panel. And if it's compressed over on the right hand side, you're going to have to take that where that white arrow is with the reddish background, and you're going to have to click it so it expands out. So it will end up going out to your um, to your uh, left hand side. And with that, let's go to slide seven. Once you open up that control panel, you will see this stuff. And underneath there, there will be um, the handouts. And you should get it there. If you're still having trouble, go ahead and write it in the uh, in the questions. But I mean, if you're seeing the hand, if you're being able to write the questions, you should be able to see the handouts. It's just the stuff right below it. And there's sort of a triangle there. You can expand, click on that. It will expand it out, and you'll see the four completed SSGs and the slide deck. So if you're still having trouble, write in the question box, and Jonathan will keep uh, track of that. So let's go back to, I think we're on slide 16. Uh, back to you, and to you, Cheryl. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Money Matters Book Discussion is a monthly um, program that the DC chapter puts on. Uh, April's uh, Money Matters Book Discussion will be held on the 18th of this month. Uh, starts at 7.30 and goes to usually till around 9 p.m. It is free and open to the public. And the book that we will be looking at is the most important thing uncommon sense for the thoughtful investor by Howard Marks. That is the area that is highlighted in yellow. And again, this is open and free to everyone. Uh, the link is down below uh, where you can either dial in using your phone or the go to meeting. And the schedule uh, can also be found down below as well by clicking where it says here. And also, if you cannot find or get through using the links on this page, you can always go to the DC Regional Chapter on betterinvesting.org and then go to local events. And then you will find the link there also for the Money Matters book discussion. Thank back you. To you. Jonathan, back to you. Okay, so the Maryland Chapters Model Club is still undergoing um, reorganization. So uh, keep checking the uh, the Maryland Chapter website for any new information. If you're interested in participating in the Model Club, uh, you can send a uh, email to the contact uh, email address uh, that's displayed, and uh, we'll keep you on our list for new and upcoming information. Thank you. And this is uh, one of the clubs I'm involved in. This is the Montgomery County Model Investment Club. There's a picture of us in the lower right. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month from seven to nine Eastern. 
Um, while we have been at the Rockville Library, we haven't been there since the pandemic, and we've just sort of gotten really happy doing stuff online. So it's free. You can come and see us. There's the GoToMeeting link. We're going to be looking at using the Maya iClub accounting, and we're going to be looking at uh, Service First uh, uh, a Bank. Um, it will be our stock to study. Um, and if you're in the area and you're interested in the club, come and visit us. Next slide. To you, Melvin. Yeah, yeah thanks, Gavin. It, it's, it's amazing. Got to get off mute. <laughs> so Melvin Brown from the Washington Metro Investment Club. We started in 1992. Got about 40 partners, including the five student partners that we have. We meet on the third Saturday of the month. So our next meeting is April the 15th from 3 to 5. It's, it's virtual. It's online. Right now, um, our education is stock to study is 2BD. Our president, Al Stewart, Albert Stewart, his email is there. Website is www.mywmic.com. If you're interested, please um, click on the link. This coming uh, April the 15th, we're having an open house. So love to see your face or love to answer any questions that you might have about our club. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you. That's that's amazing. You have that many people in your club. Cheryl, over to you. All right. Um, I belong uh, to the DC uh, Regional um, Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia. Uh, we started in 2008 and uh, we're about to have 11 partners. We're unfortunately losing a partner. Um, the uh, next meeting's on April 11th. It's the second Tuesday of each month from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we used to meet at the Tyson's Pimmet Library, but like uh, uh, Kevin's club, we have pretty much gone virtual. Uh, and there is the link for a hyperlink for you to join. The next education is going to be uh, PEG ratio or PE over growth. And the stock to study, we just got news on that. It is installed building products. The ticker is IBP, as in Paul. And we'd love to uh, see you. It's free and open to all visitors. Thank you. And also I'm doing this slide as well. Um, we have two uh, types of programs. Uh, one of them is listings uh, that are covered either under the DC regional chapter or the Maryland chapter, depending on which one you would be involved with. Uh, we're listing clubs that are looking for partners. Um, and there are quite a few of them. And so uh, you are able to kind of take your pick depending on where, where which one is closest to you. Uh, the other program is having a chapter director come out and visit your club, either during the club meeting or at another time if there is a conflict. And we can do it either virtually or we can do it in person. Uh, come out and present programs that would be of help to your members or be of interest to your members. And all you have to do is uh, go into uh, either the Maryland chapter or the DC chapter and look under contacts uh, to get a name of someone to be in contact with and then also the visit a club. And back to you. <laughs> okay, since this is digging into the BI, we do want to be able to show you how to uh, some of the features that are in this article or in this magazine. Again, you can get this electronically. I've asked a couple times in the past how many people um, look at either the app or the e-magazine, and almost universally, everyone is like, "I'd rather wait for the hard copy to come to me." But it usually comes up two or two to three weeks earlier electronically that you can be able to find. Um, so if you want to know how to be able to put this on, get it on your computer or laptop, or your smartphone or a tablet or any other electronic device, let's go to the next slide. And over here, if you see where the green arrow is on the left-hand side, that's the Better Investing Magazine for mobile devices. Um, it's a different sign-in than what you normally have. So click on that and sort of go through the process there. And then the other thing that's really nice at this location, because again, there's a lot more stuff on the website than just in the magazine. If you see where that red arrow is, that analyst reports and other resources, 
those are the resources that show up that are part of the additional resources that are part of the stock to study and undervalued feature. So when they say in the magazine that there's additional stuff, that's where you can find it. And then if you go over into the center where it says view the uh, magazine issues, the one where the green is in the center, if you click on that, we'll go to the next slide and voila, you will be where we're supposed to be. This again, we sort of like to feature it. And this every April since about 83 or 84, they've had sort of a, a article that features the top 100 holdings of investment clubs. Um, and and they, this has been going on. They used to manually have people submit it. Now it's just sort of all the people in my iClub that I have so that uh, they track it and put it in there. And one of the things that I always found interesting when I first came in in the early 2000s was Ken Jenke, um, who was uh, part of Better Investing for almost 50 years at headquarters, is that he always liked to look at the stocks that were new to the list, either new to the top 100 or new to the top 200, or ones that had moved a lot. And you'll see in this article over in the lower right-hand side of that screen capture where it says big movers, you can see the ones that moved up the most. Um, and so we're going to feature two of those tonight. And let's go to the next slide. And we did want to, I wasn't gonna do it, but all of a sudden I was looking through the magazine and I see one of our clubs from, from this area, from Calvert County was featured in there. So if your, your club is featured, let us know. We'd like to be able to sort of toot our own horn, uh, but uh, it's always nice to be able to see how other clubs operate. So there's no one right way or wrong way to do things. And uh, I just sort of learn a lot from taking a look at it. And I have to agree with this thing here is that the, you know, is if you enjoy the people you're with, you end up doing stuff with them outside of your regular club meetings. Maybe not with all of them, but there are several people in my clubs that I, I like to hang out with uh, because we all have common interest. Next slide. And also we like to be able to feature some of the events that are going on in some of the other chapters, South Florida chapter. I see a couple of them here in the audience. Uh, they have their investor day on Saturday, April 22nd. Uh, it's 20 bucks. It's online. And you can see down there where the blue is, some of the uh, programs that they're going to have on there. And another one that caught my eye was over on the uh, the other coast, the left coast. Uh, the Washington chapter has a, a, a program that's for free that talks about a cheat sheet for the stock selection guide. Um, so that's from 6.30 to 8 uh, Pacific time on the 24th of this month. So check those things out. Next slide. All right, we've done enough talking about that stuff. Now it's let's talk about stock. So we'll first turn it over to Cheryl and tell us all about Lululemon. Okay, I am going to be looking at Lululemon. Uh, Lululemon uh, was founded by Chip Wilson in Vancouver, Canada in 1998. Uh, it's a yoga-inspired technical athletic apparel company for men and women. And what started as a design studio by day and a yoga studio by night became a standalone store in November of 2000 on West 4th Avenue, Vancouver, Canada. We wanted to create a community hub where people could learn and discuss the physical aspects of healthy living, mindfulness, and living a life of possibility. It is also important for us to create real relationships with our guests and understand what they are passionate about, how they like to sweat, and help them celebrate their goals. Our first designs were made for women to wear during yoga. Through plenty of feedback from our guests, ambassadors, and elite athletes, we now design for yoga, running, cycling, training, and most other sweaty pursuits for men and women. Not to mention our designers are athletes and sweat-minded people too. A constant in our desire to empower people to reach their full potential through providing the right tools and resources and encouraging a culture of leadership, goal setting and personal responsibility. Our core values of personal responsibility, entrepreneurship, honesty, courage, connection, fun and inclusion are lived by our people every day and are at the heart of our unique company culture. So Lululemon Athletica is a designer and retailer, again, of yoga-inspired athletic clothing and accessories. 
including pants, shorts, tops, and jackets. Cells under the, the Lululemon Athletica and IVIVVA Athletica brand names. Products are primarily sold online and through the company's retail stores. They have 623 stores in Canada, the US, Australia, the UK, Singapore, China, and that's as of July 1st, 2022. By geographic mix, the US accounted for 70% of fiscal year 22 revenues, Canada 15%, and outside of North America 15%. This excludes 22 licensed stores purchased in-home fitness company Mirror in 2020. Power of three times two is a five-year plan laid out at Lululemon's April 22 investor event as sound. The firm's three priorities are product innovation, e-commerce, and international expansion. We think product innovation is critical as many competitors, including No Moat Gap Athletica, sell women's leggings of similar qual quality. Thus, Lululemon will need to introduce new fabrics and technologies to hold this popularity in this critical category. The firm also plans to add to its assortment in men's 24.6% of 2021 sales and expand its nascent athletic footwear line. And when I say we think, I'm talking for the company, not for me. <laughs> Boosted by the pandemic, Expect Lululemon's e-commerce will become increasingly important. We estimate 30% growth for the channel in 2022 and expect e-commerce sales will permanently exceed store revenue in 2023. Lululemon's e-commerce should benefit from investments in digital capabilities. There is more opportunity for Lululemon to expand outside of North America. Sales outside the region accounted for just 15% of total in 2021, but have been growing more than 30% per year. They believe Lululemon is building its brand overseas and has a large opportunity for new stores and larger online sales in China, the second largest activewear market. In 2031, they forecast sales outside of North America will reach 4.5 billion up from 957 million in 2021 and account for 24% of total sales. The market for technical athletic apparel is very competitive with increasing competition from both established players and new entrants. Lulu compete directly against wholesalers and direct retailers, including Nike, Adidas, AG, and Under Armour. Lulu also faces competition from retailers focused on women's athletic apparel, such as The Gap, The Athleta Brand, and L Brands, Victoria's Sport, and Victoria's Secret. That said, Lulu's competitive advantage is its unique positioning in the upscale market and brand loyalty. Capital expenditures were 111.4 million in quarter one of 2022, compared to 64.2 million in quarter one 2021. The quarter one 2022 capital expenditures were primarily related to corporate expenditures driven by investment in technology and business systems, as well as corporate office renovations. The capital expenditures were also related to capital for new store locations, as well as remodeling stores to support the footwear launch. Inventories increased 85%. And here is a picture of their newest store in Paris. And as you can see there by the stores in, in North America on the left, uh, they try to keep pretty much the same for each of the locations, no matter where they're at. The Essential program, Membership Program 
will launch this fall. It's focused on bringing the community, fitness, and shopping together all in one place. Within the next five years, they expect about 80% of their guests becoming a part of one of our, the membership programs. And here is uh, our familiar uh, outside resources. Uh, Morningstar right now is giving it two stars. Uh, the last close was $364.19 with a fair value of $233. So they're trading at a 56% premium. Um, the capital allocation is exemplary uh, and they also have a, uh, a narrow moat. Uh, with CFRA, uh, they are looking at um, the list price. This was back in February. They still have a moat trend of stable uh, with a market cap of $39.45. Uh, again, capital allocation is exemplary. Uh, they're recommending a hold at three stars, and they're saying that the um, 12 month target price is going to be $425. So they still have a ways to go to get to that target price. And they're also doing a three year projected earnings per share of 28%. And looking at um, value line, uh, this was back at the end of January. <clears throat> they, had, <clears throat> they had a PE ratio of 28.7 which was higher than the average of 25. Uh, their timeliness right now is a three and their annual total return is going to be somewhere between 11 and 23%. They view Lululemon as a best in class retailer with a strong brand, seasoned leadership and loyal customer base. The stock has little change since their last full page report in October, but capital appreciation potential remains worthwhile, especially when considering the company's strong balance sheet. Near term, the shares are neutral really, neutrally ranked for timeliness. Five minutes, Cheryl. Uh, thank you. I uh, looked at Lululemon in core SSG. Uh, this is the um, historical stock price is the price bars and the sales and earnings per share, sales being the green line, earnings being the blue line, and this just gives you the numbers uh, across the way. Looking at the pre-tax profit on sales in comparison to boot barn holdings, um, uh, no, that's not right either. Okay, uh, had some different comparisons there, uh, but I didn't change them on this particular slide. But as you can see, uh, Lulu in, that, in the black line is on top of all the competitors here. Looked for some more uh, companies that were more in line with the um, high product and that Lulu had. I looked to Nordstrom's, um, Macy's and Tapestry uh, and RH, which does high-end um, uh, furniture. Uh, and you can see they're all pretty much clumped together on that straight line. Total debt and debt to capital. Uh, this is just looking at uh, Lululemon is the black line and the industry average is the blue line. And they have, are very much in control of their debt uh, closer to the bottom of the graph rather than the uh, industry average, which is uh, coming out on the top of the graph. Uh, forecast sales uh, with the data comes out to be a growth rate uh, average over the 10 years of 19.2%. Uh, I chose to cut back uh, because of some um, talk in the different resources about sales dipping in the, the next coming years to 15%. And that gave me a estimated growth rate of 14.118 million, which is comes at 14 billion actually. 
uh, looking at the forecast sales to earnings. Um, here again are the earnings numbers, which come out to be about a 19.4% growth rate. Again, uh, they talked about earnings being less in the future month, years right now, so I put it in as 15%. Assessing risk and reward that the buy range goes from 255 to 387.1, and the uh, my SSG just came in uh, right close to the top of the buy zone, but still within it at 364.3 million. Um, and you can see the top in the forecasted high price, 783.5, gives me an upside downside ratio of 3.8 to one with a five-year average PE of 42.9 and the current PE being 54.5. Now to determine the five-year potential, the potential annualized price appreciation uh, with my judgments comes out to 16.5%. Lululemon does not pay a dividend, so the annual rate of return is the same. Um, and in conclusion, uh, it is a medium-sized growth company. It's well-managed, currently overvalued, and it's trading above its five-year average PE. It closed at 364.30 on the 31st of March and is a buy up to 387 and 10 cents with a 3.8 to one upside downside and a 16.5% total return. This could be a, uh, a good consumer cyclical uh, watch list candidate, uh, but you wanna keep your eye on the 2024 sales which are supposed to dip somewhat and then come back up. The free cash flow, which is being used currently uh, to open and renovate new stores mainly, and the quarterly data, which is also uh, on a slightly uh, downward trend for the last two quarters. So those are the things you need to keep your eye on, but it could also, if it came within uh, the good signs, then you could uh, look at it as a watch list candidate. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'm up now and I'm going to be talking about Micron Technologies. Uh, this was one of the ones that moved up the most into the top 100. It's now sitting at 93. Let's take a look at it and go to our next slide. So again, what I did, and this is not only for this presentation, but the one immediately after me that Ed's going to do, is that we looked at all the stuff that came in that was new to either the top 100 in that upper left or down in the center where it was new to the 200. And I took one that was new to the 100, MU Micron Technology, and then down below was um, uh Ed was looking at Enphase. And again, you shouldn't necessarily look at these as it's a, that you should buy these. It's just that these are ones that people in our community are purchasing and uh, some that moved up a lot from uh, December 2021 to December of 2022. And so uh, there's some really interesting ones on there and some that we've already featured here. And you can see that with the red year that uh, will show you when we had it as one of our presentations here and digging into the BI. Let's go to our next slide. So I, you know, this is an area that I'm not an expert in. So, you know, I had to even figure out what a semiconductor is and why should I care? It really is, a, it's a material which has an electrical conductivity between a conductor and an insulator. And that is basically the foundation of modern electronics. This goes all the way back to the 1820s. It became commercially viable predominantly with Intel. I'm sure there were other people around in the 1960s. And in 2020, there were 930 billion chips made in the world. And really, and several other people have said this, that semiconductors are really the brains of electronic uh, devices and really any kind of electronic information. And we'll see that as we go through these slides. Next slide. So, um, and the other thing that's really kind of interesting with this uh, industry is that 
They've got a whole bunch of acronyms that make uh, would make the military proud. Uh, you've got to know all their buzzwords. I spent a lot of time looking up what something meant. Uh, but they also have things that in the semiconductor industry where some people uh, just design the stocks. They're uh, called, I'll go back one more, uh, fabless um, are ones that just design. That would be something like in NVIDIA. Uh, some just make it. They're a foundry or fabrication, which is Taiwan Semiconductor, which we'll look at next month. And some of them design and make like Micron Technologies. The second part is that there are some companies that are very diversified and, and are in several parts of the semiconductor industry like Intel. And then others are singularly focused, generally called Pure Plays. And there's a hyperlink if you want to know more about Pure Plays, uh, where Micron is. And so what they really do is they work... Um, you know, I can read you all the acronyms over on the right, but really what it is is that they sell memory and storage chips to companies that make and design their own products. So you don't go on out and say, boy, I really would like to have a Micron uh, chip in my stuff. You just buy your computer, your phone, your smart device, uh, stuff in your cars, and they will, uh, and whoever they're using, that's who you're going to have for your, uh, your, your chips. Let's go to our next slide. So here's sort of the basics. It's in the S&P 500, so this is not an undiscovered gem. They're out of Boise, Idaho. They've been an IP. They've been public since almost 40 years now. And just to give you an idea, the global semiconductor sales annually is 550 billion, and the market where Micron is in memory and storage is about 150 billion and growing. And so you can see they're 23 billion. They still have a lot of room to uh, grow with it. The three leading players are both Samsung, SK Hynix, if I'm saying that name correctly, and them. But there are several others, but it's highly cyclical. Uh, it's a big driver. And a lot of the things that we're talking about in AI, robotics, big data, Internet of Things, all of those things are going to be necessary because of the growth that's going on in, in capturing this information and doing the storage that the chips can help you with it. Um, it has a so-so core score for people who know Manifest. If you don't, don't worry about that. Uh, the value line numbers, uh, the, the graph up there, it doesn't look so super great. Uh, it doesn't have a moat, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. It has standard allocation, but it does have a good financial health. It's part of your BI subscription that's in there. But basically what they do is the, the two that they have is a, D, uh, a DRAM, uh, Dynamic Random Access Memory, if I got it right, and NAND, uh, I forget what that is. But uh, two-thirds of their, or three-quarters of their stuff is in uh, the DRAM, um, and the other uh, quarter is in the uh, NAND. Um, so let's go to our next slide, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. So if you look at the SSG, and I'm looking at this in core, it really fails that acid test. Uh, you know, you get four quarters and it's just not looking good. Uh, the latest quarter is awful. The return on equity is, is acceptable in passing. But this really shows you with this graph where you see there's a negative number for earnings in 2016 and it's cratering here. That's the impact of both chip shortage, interest rates, economic contraction, and also the, really the highly cyclical nature in which you're doing it. Um, in this last year, they had both a chip shortage and a chip oversupply, and that's really what they're doing is that they're writing off $1.3 billion in inventory because the fact is that they had an oversupply. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I like looking at the CFRA report. It's, uh, it, they have a really good amount of information there. Um, sorry, I'm trying to stop something. Um, the um, CFRA, I really like this. this. is a great way to get a nice summary of what they filed in the SEC without reading through a lot of it. It's a nice synthesis that CFRA goes through, but you can be able to see that there's they're in a broad range of uh, electronic devices. Um, they still see, Micron still sees their DRAM as having demand uh, in the mid-teens, and the, the big growth is going to be in the NANDI, if I'm, again, if I'm saying that correctly, in the low to mid-20s. Um, it's highly capital intensive, so it requires a lot of investment. You'll see that there was a notice that uh, they're building a new American plant for $150 billion with a B, and I believe it's upstate New York. Um, and so they, to help reduce some of the costs, they do a lot of stuff with uh, – with uh, do a lot of joint ventures. Um, so they do have to really be careful that one minute they're really feast and the next minute it's famine. 
Next slide. Um, here's just a look at the flash memory. I like looking at Statistica. It's a German-based company that has uh, um, that does a lot of good graphs. You can see the major players down at the bottom is Samsung. Um, Coaxi is a Japanese company that's being bought out. Uh, it's in the process of being bought out by Western Digital. There's a Korean company, uh, SK Hydrix. There's Micron and then Intel. And so Micron is sort of, you know, they're sort of third or fourth in this setup. But they uh, they really have continually growing in, in the areas that they're handling it. But they're, the other two companies, uh, the other two Korean companies, really have a much more diversified outlay in terms of what they're doing. Next slide. Uh, this comes again from uh, Micron's own uh, investor day. And again, you can see how they're estimating their growth. If you see, I, I, again, three quarters is in DRAM and the other quarter is in NANDI. And you can see their projections. This is my, uh, Micron's projections. If we go all the way over to the far right where you see, uh, you can see what sources they go into, whether they're into mobile or PC or industrial cars. I read somewhere that during all this that I think there's something like 900 chips that are in a car. We're not even talking about the electronic via, the electric vehicles. We're just talking about a modern car right now has all these chips that are in it for diagnostic and what have you. And so you can see that there's a lot of growth that can go on, but it's going to go up and down. Next slide. Um, so Micron really survives on patents. They've had over 50,000 patents since their inception. And so what happens is they get this nice patent and it goes there. But there's still something that they're working off of called Moore's Law. It's named after Gordon Moore, who just passed away, co-founder of, um, of Intel, is that his observation, it's not really a law, but an observation that the capacity on chips double every two years. So he spent all this time building up this patent. And next thing you know, in a couple of years, you got to do something else because technology has changed so fast. So that's the reason why a company like Micron really can't develop a moat around their business like uh, like some other companies can. So they're constantly having to innovate. And uh, their advantage is that they really are integrated inside the memory and storage. That's all they do. A lot of the other people are foreign-based. And here was one thing I found that this, um, hopefully I'm going to say his name right, this value investing guru, who's a Warren Buffett disciple, Monesh uh, Habari, if I'm saying that right, he's out of India, but he his largest position is in Micron. And he says, you can look at this Moore's Law and everything else, but bottom line, this is where the big growth is going to be coming in. The, when we're talking about AI, Internet of Things, big data, it's all generated because of, of these chips and the memory chips that Micron is in. Next slide. Five minutes, Kevin. Thank you. To see more, here's some information that I found that was really kind of interesting. You can click on any of those and be able to get more information on them. I found it very interesting to, to take a look at this. Let's go to the next slide. So let's look at the SSG in core. Um, and again, it doesn't really have a good direct competitor. So what I'm just doing is I'm putting out the industry average in the peer group, and you can see that they're much better. And you can see the cyclical nature in that black line for Micron. Um, historically, it's around 11.8, but this latest quarter is really, really awful. Nothing more to say, but that shows you the cyclical nature of this company. Next slide. You see the same thing here with earnings. Again, ups and downs very much so, but long term, that growth is still 34%. Um, even though you know they, they had to write some stuff off. And if you if you start your SSG from the latest quarter, you're gonna get a number that probably won't even come up to what their last year's earnings were. So be careful of that when you do it. But this latest quarter, uh, the quarter over quarter is horrendous, uh, but that's again because they had to write off 1.4 billion. Next slide. Uh, Pre-tax profit. Again, it generally is pretty good, but you're going to see that it's not straight lines. We talk about up straight and parallel. This is not it. They are parallel and they will go up. They're just not straight. So you got two out of three. And as Meatloaf said, two out of three ain't bad. So anyway, take a look at this. But this sort of really tells you there's some really good money to be made even with all those the cyclicality of this company next slide 
return on equity. Um, it's good, not great, but good. One of the things that helps it is that it has much lower debt than a lot of the other companies in their area. So they, they do much better. Uh, they're not as leveraged. But that's a good number. But like I said, not a super, super great number. And again, you can see when you look at that return on equity, it goes from 46 to, to 7, back to 17. So it bounces around a lot. This will be like going on a roller coaster. Next slide. Debt to capital, clearly the, the best in there, even though they're taking on a lot of debt in this last year, it really, really jumped. Um, their guidance uh, for the company for this quarter and for the next one are not good. But generally the talk is, and you'll see that Motley Fool story that I highlighted, is that a lot of them are saying this is the time to get in. Um, you know, it doesn't look good on the SSG, though if you're sort of new and starting out, this may be tough to do. But if you have some experience and you understand this area, this may be a potential pro uh, possibility to get in, in a stop, uh, at a spot like this. But again, um, lower debt than its uh, industry average. Our forecasted sales, uh, no, we can go to 63. Forecasted sales, like I said, historic is 11.8. I went with six. I did forecasted earnings growth at 9.7. Um, my sales probably could have been a little bit higher or maybe being a little bit too cautious. But the fact is, is that when you compare that historically, and you'll see with my numbers, they really sort of project out not too unreasonable, uh, even though the latest quarters, and again, these last two quarters have been awful. And so don't start your judgment from the latest quarter with a company like this. Next slide. One minute, Kevin. Thank you. So here are my high and low PEs. I kept them pretty close with that. I have a high, P, a high price of 132 off of a forecasted high of, of 13. Um, I just went with a, a third off of the high price, so it's at 40. And if we go to the next slide, we should be able to finish this out. My upside downside is a 3.5 to 1. Pretty straightforward. Next slide. Uh, my five-year potential is 17.3. It's really kind of reasonable, and they just started paying a dividend. Finally, next slide. Um, these are two things that are new that just showed up. I won't talk about them, but uh, they're now in core, and they're now up on the banner there, so you can take a look at it. Great way to double-check your stuff to make sure you're doing right. Again, this confirms what we already know. It's a highly cyclical company and a highly cyclical industry with wide expansions. Next slide. This is really new and really cool is that you can use the member sentiment as sort of like another judgment, just like your, if you use Yahoo Finance to take a look. So they're sort of median and my numbers are fairly close to them, maybe a little bit more optimistic than others, but it's a great way to sort of double check. Let's go to our last and final slide. I have it as a large growth company with big swings. It's well managed, but it really goes up and down. It's severely overvalued if we we're using the BI metrics, but it, it will eventually be right back into its spot. I think it's a buy up to 63 and it's currently selling at 60. Could be a candidate if, you, if you're kind of bullish on this to purchase it, if you have a long-term view. If you're a little bit more cautious, you may want to wait on another quarter and put it on your watch list. That's it. Thank you. Let's go to Ed. Good evening. Next slide. As um, Kevin mentioned, this was uh, a new entry into the BI top 200. That's where we found this stock. Next. This text is kind of what you would normally encounter in a uh, website uh, for the company. It's pretty dry. You could look at it, maybe not fully understand uh, the elements out of this. Uh, what I wanna do is dissect this a little bit for you. Next slide. So what we're gonna do is focus in on three elements of that earlier statement, one of, uh, and you can see them each highlighted. Number two should have also included the word microinverter. We're gonna to touch a little bit uh, on uh, base on, on that element of this statement. Next. So when we talk about a, a global energy company, uh, I wanna emphasize this is a, a fairly large company, even though by BI standards, it's considered a medium. They've installed over 300 uh, million, uh, I'm sorry, over 3 million systems across the entire world, specifically under 45 countries. 
It's customers is uh, homeowners, installers, distributors. So they have multiple channels that they pursue. Uh, in regards to the uh, installers, they have a fairly sizable uh, network, about 1,300 of them that help install these systems uh, at, uh, in homes. Um, this last item here is microinverters. So when you think of in-phase, uh, for most people that are, are acquainted with the company, uh, one of the first things they really think of is really micro inverters. This company has sold 58 million of these. Let's let's talk about those a little bit more. Next slide, please. So for those that may not know what a micro inverter is, there's a few things I want to highlight here towards the middle of the slide. You'll see uh, its main purpose is really to convert the DC energy that comes off of uh, solar panels into AC power, which is what most things run off of. The other thing I want to point out is architecturally, uh, the difference between a microinverter and a string inverter is you you have a more effective uh, power that you get. If uh, and with a microinverter, if one one um, panel is is obscured with shade, it will impact power for the entire system. Uh, with microinverters, you avoid that. So there on the right side, you see a picture of a microinverter. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is not just, you know, a, 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 a generic piece of equipment. It's actually fairly high tech. Embedded in there, you'll see a picture of a, a, a semiconductor chip. This is a custom chip that's developed specifically for uh, Enphase to do some of the processing it does. Um, the other thing is Enphase actually has about 259, uh, over 259 patents. So a little bit later, you'll see the opinion of, um, Morningstar that there's no mode here. With this many patents, there are elements of what in phase does that in my opinion it might constitute a mode. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Next slide. The other thing that I, I think distinguishes in phase from a multitude of other companies that do some of these things is that they've created an integrated picture of how they want to do um, solar generation, storage, and management all on one platform. I'm not going to go through each of these, but the point I'm making here with this slide is that they have a truly integrated system that does uh, basically uh, almost as much as you would want to do when it comes down to uh, solar in a, in a residential um, environment. Next slide. So let's take a simpler view of this picture. The three things I want to emphasize, they, they sell microconverters, a uh, recent effort that they've started is selling batteries. This is to store the power that the batteries uh, accumulate from the sun, and, and you can use it later. And lastly, there's a person standing in front there. You can't see it, but the, they're holding a, a mobile phone, and, and on that phone is a mobile app that helps that individual um, manage these electrical systems, understand if they're doing a good job, bad job, or, or, or if they need to call maintenance, et cetera. This is a very nice feature and part of this integrated view that Enphase has uh, in regards to their product line. Next slide. So a few words on where sales come from. Um, it, uh, two things I wanna point out here. Most of their sales are in the United States and not shown on here, but I'll, I'll mention most of those sales are actually too uh, associated with residential uh, um, uh, residential uh, uh, customers. Um, the other type of customer could be, you could be trying to sell to energy companies and setting up really big uh, solar farms. That's not what they're focused in on. The second thing I wanna note is inter internationally, they are growing tremendously. Now, the, the base is smaller than what they do in the United States, but they importantly are increasing their sales year over year, um, in, uh, in Europe, and uh, even though these numbers are only for 2000 uh, through 2021, um, that that trend continues into 2022. Next slide. So one of the things that really excites me about in phase is really the way they have uh, looked at their product line. Through a series of acquisitions, they have uh, basically put cobbled together uh, different capabilities that now provide them to provide this in-phase installer platform. It's, an intended, it's intended to support the entire life cycle 
of folks that do this kind of business, the installers. The, they, it helps them understand the marketing with the lead management all the way down to permits and, and financing, et cetera. So that I think they've been very smart and strategic in spending their money um, in, in making these, uh, uh, these uh, significant acquisitions. Next slide. So what do the analysts think? So I mentioned before that, um, you know, I, I kind of believe when you take a look at their combination of capabilities along with their patents that maybe you could make an argument from, from Moat. Um, I'm not prepared to contradict Morningstar uh, at this point, but it's interesting to note that they don't think a Moat exists. Probably to, for similar reasons as what you heard Kevin a few minutes talk about, which is that product cycles here are pretty quick. So it's hard to kind of come up with one product that is has a competitive advantage that it will exist for many, many years to come. They, they really are, uh, as, as well as the rest of the industry, always working to improve their product and putting out something better. Um, number two here is you can see that the price range already is in the target range of, of what um, value line expects it to be X number of years, several years down down the road. So one could question how much um, price appreciation uh, is is expected for the stock. Three, um, this is a really pretty risky stock. It is a lot of risk per the write up in 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 uh, value line. Has a lot of volatility with it. Here they offer a suggestion on how if you want to participate with solar stuff, you can uh, you can buy an ETF. Um, the last point to be made here, and you don't often see this in, in write-ups, they make the point of that this stock trades on, on not just fundamentals like sales and earnings, so on news, solar news, uh, and news regarding the solar industry and its competitors. So, uh, let, let's take a look at the solar industry a little bit closer. Next slide. So these are uh, sniglets out of, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see it's from the Solar Energy Industry Association. So you got to take this with, but nonetheless, they, they, they saw like that the, there's been massive growth in this industry. That's pretty unambiguous. You just got to look at the uh, sales numbers for not just Enphase, but some of its uh, other competitors. Two, um, you'll see that the penetration right now, as far as the amount of energy being generated, is only like 5% today. So there is an opportunity for, uh, there are a lot of houses out there without solar panels, I guess is one way to put it. Number three, you can see that there's been a pretty significant drop in cost over time. The pandemic led, well, the pandemic and specifically uh, supply chain constraints led to some uh, price increases. I expect that to level off and continue uh, decreasing um, over over time as uh, innovation continues to provide uh, a good bang for the buck. And lastly, um, I mentioned before one of the three things that I thought was pretty important was this this concept of uh, in phase offering battery storage. As you can see, this is an important trend that they're just simply going along with, which is that solar now gets paired up with with um, battery storage, um, so that people have a little bit more flexibility in making use of the power that they get. Next slide. Five minutes. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, other things, so other macro things, and I won't go through each of these, but, you know, if you start taking a look at our prospects for energy down the road, and even as close as the mid-Atlantic region here in the United States, uh, we may be facing some pretty severe challenges of which perhaps, you know, um, uh, uh, solar energy at the residents may help mitigate some of the concerns that might exist uh, again by the 1930s here, um, and that that's beyond uh, power grid failure. And and again, over in Europe, that the concern they have about how are they going to keep themselves warm, how are they going to provide power. Next, so a few key takeaways here. I won't read these. The the green stars represent what I consider to be. Um, tailwinds 
that are positive for for in phase the red star represents the reality of us going into higher interest rates and that will influence uh, decisions to be made as far as uh spending money uh, um by the way don't underestimate the the uh the historic and future power of these tax credits that are available through the inflation reduction act next slide so let's take a look at the ssg um they're number one here boy that looks like a mess that's not your classic up straight and parallel greatly influencing this situation is that they uh in phases only in recent years started to show a profit so that accounts for at least partly some of the skewing of of these numbers and, and them not being the classic bi uh pattern that you look for and the number two uh the selected uh values for for sales and eps are really um derated values off of the analyst consensus estimates that are on that slide um the numbers from a variety of different places were all over the place so this one thing is that there is really not much of a clear consistent consensus in regards to the future performance for for uh in phase um next slide but I do want to talk a little bit about the, ma the metrics that are generally associated with management. Uh, as I just mentioned before, in the number one, they just finally became profitable. That's what those uh, um, uh, number one points out. Number two, you'll see that the debt to capital took pretty significant hits uh, uh, in the 19, 2019 through 21. That is the cost of the acquisitions that I mentioned earlier. On the number three, it's comforting to see that that ratio is being back, brought back under control. And as a side note, uh, Enphase is well-funded with, with a fair amount of uh, cash available. Uh, so it, it, it can self-fund a lot of their activities. And number four, or um, uh, return on investment of 62% is a very good number and indicative of strong management performance. Next slide. Here uh, are the classic things out of the SSG. Uh, these numbers, as you can see for yourself, are all over the place and frankly, uh, not realistic. So we'll have to use some degree of judgment on how do we devalue these uh, going forward as for we fill out values in the SSG. Next. So one of the things I usually do, and let me let me refer to the bottom part first, is I, I like to, and historically I do this when I do these presentations, I like to look at historical patterns for PE ratios. Uh, and, and for this stock, this does not help me whatsoever. These numbers are all over the place. So uh, we take a look at it, but it's not of any real value, at least in, in, in terms of the analysis. Up on top, uh, I, I uh, my personal preference is I like to take a look at at uh, support levels. That's part of technical analysis to help me determine whether what what the the low price value that I plug into the SSG will be. You can see here that I have two values here. I actually opted for the less aggressive low value, so the smaller value, where I think this stock could possibly go down as far as 116. Next. So here I've plugged in some, some numbers on the one. Uh, if you recall a few slides ago, I think the average high P, uh, PDE ratio was three digits, well over a hundred. Uh, here, I don't think you're, it's, you know, it's not plausible to see this going forward. Uh, those kind of PE ratios, I've selected 80. I thought that was pretty conservative. Under number two, as I mentioned, I selected the more conservative low value price uh, for the PE. Next slide. And what this yields is this this determination, basically a three uh, three point six to one upside ratio. We are in the buy zone on uh, for this stock. Next uh, next slide, please. So summarize and phase a medium sized company. It's fast growing. It's recently profitable. I think it's on a good vector in, in regards to those things. You saw some of the metrics in regards to it being well managed. And, and I love it's, it's a coherent and strong 
strategic vision for how they're kind of in providing an integrated capability. Uh, it's slightly on the price. It's a buy up to that value. And it is a medium to high risk company that's growing fast. And it, it has strong margins. And I think uh, oh, I'm looking for it to be able to leverage some of the tailwinds that I've identified for you this evening. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And let's go to our next presentation. And Melvin, bring us home with uh, Walgreens. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Walgreens um, Boots Alliance was the BI Better Investing April 2023 undervalued stock that we will be uh, talking about today. And I want to I want to do something, you know, just a little different. I want to talk about its management up front um, because they did something that was, you know, what, what I think is in line with what they want to do. So uh, Ross Brewer joined Walmart's alliance as the chief executive officer in 2021. Um, she served as the chief executive officer for president of Starbucks from October of 2017 to 2021. And prior to that, she was the president and CEO of Sam's Club. Uh, a membership um, online retail warehouse club driven, you know, primarily by Walmart. And, and so uh, she has the the background, I believe, to to help move uh, Walmart forward, uh, Walgreens forward rather. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about Walgreens. A Walgreens Boot Alliance is one of the largest retail pharmacy chains in the U.S. with over 8,500 locations. Uh, Walgreens makes up about 20% of the total prescription revenue in the United States. Um, the company was founded by Charles R. Walgreens and John Boot in 1901 and is headquartered in Deerfield, Illinois. Um, next slide. And so attempting to keep up with uh, the competitors, Walgreens Boots uh, is matching other retail pharmacy giants by developing a domestic network of health and wellness clinics through acquisitions plus increased stakes in partner businesses and related financial redeployments. The company is developing an infrastructure to meet the consumer healthcare needs. The company entered into this uh, this healthcare market is expected to be its chief growth chief growth driver. Um, specifically <clears throat> getting into this segment by uh, being able to contribute to about sales estimated to be about $1.8 billion, uh, which is 1.4% of the total. Uh, they've had a flurry of related investment deals that have contributed to the company's relatively high level of indebtedness. And so they made some investments into these villages going forward. They, they plan to open about 600 of these healthcare stations uh, going forward. But the thing that I wanna highlight is, you know, Walgreens, you know, as a result of some of those early investments, th their sales grew by 3.3%. And so their uh, Morningstar analysts had a maintained value of about, about $48. And so we believe that uh, some of their early investments into this new market is starting to bear fruit. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that, that I like to do when I do these analysis is I, I've discovered this thing called the economic mode and I'm, I'm starting to get a better understanding of it and why it's important. And so right now, if you look at um, Wal Walgreens competitors, uh, which are, you know, CVS, Walmart and Dollar General are, are considered to be competitors in this space by Morningstar. Morningstar gives us a, a four star rating as a as a company. Um, but it has no economic moat and the moaning trend is, is kind of negative, which means that there are no economic advantages uh, over between now and the next 10 years for this stock compared to um, CVS, which has uh, got a narrow moat, which means over the next 10 years, it does have a competitive advantage. And Walmart, who has a wide moat, also has a 20 year competitive advantage. So um, they believe the fair market value for this stock is somewhere around $48. And they believe if you look at the entire uh, healthcare or, or pharmacy industry, uh, it, it's undervalued. And the other thing that I will say about the this industry, this pharmacy industry, is we oftentimes try to look at things that are either a buyer or a seller's market. And this is this is clearly a seller's market because the pharmacy industry can can sort of dictate their price, uh, if nothing else, for their prescription drugs uh, going forward. Next slide. 
So when we look at the projections for this stock, I, I, I'm using the <clears throat> the value line projections. And if you look to the left from 2025 to 2027, uh, they're projecting a high price um, over the next 18 months. And so this is an 18 month projection um, because of where we are right now. We're somewhere around um, $55, uh, which is a, about a 50% jump from where, almost a 50% jump from where the stock is right now. Um, which would give you about a 15% return. And then they're, they're looking at a low price of about $30, $35. And then, as you'll see later, uh, it's trending already below the low price. Um, if you look to the right, when we look at the earnings per share, you know, the average earning per share is somewhere, but industry average is somewhere between 20 and 25. This is definitely trending well below that with an average earning per share of about 5.7%. So, you know, it's not jumping off the page, but it, it's below the, the industry average. And it's got a dividend yield of about 5.3%. Next slide. So one of the things, you know, we did this in the SSG Plus. And so when we started to look at it from a, a quarter perspective, because it had had a couple of negative quarters, the, the SSG Plus, uh, recommended that you look at maybe an the current annual return and 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 manage it that way. And so that's what we did. And so if you look at where they are uh, this time last year, so this this quarter com um, compared to a year ago, you can see that they've got that 3.3 percent growth. Uh, the analysts estimated that the sales over the next two years are going to be um, somewhere around three percent. And so that's that's pretty consistent with where. I think things are going to be headed for the stock also, and, and so I just kind of stayed with the analyst estimates on this one because we didn't have uh, a good trend to start from going forward. So if you look at the historic sales, we we put in the, the analyst estimate of about 3.8 percent. The historic earnings per share, uh, earnings per share long term, we believe that you know we can stick with the analysts on this one at about 2.1 percent going forward. And then if you look down at the bottom, that debt to capital ratio down in the bottom, it, what's contributing to that is the investment that they've made in these healthcare facilities, because that's going to be the, the larger part of their growth strategy going forward. Next slide. So when we look at historical sales, it, as you can see, they, they're just above the industry average, but they're below their competitors in sales. Uh, Walmart is the leader, followed by CVS, and then um, Walgreens falls just just below that. And Rite Aid, who's a major competitor, is considered near the bottom. And so the, um, Walgreens is trading in somewhere around number three as it relates to sale overall sales in this industry. Next slide. And so as we look at earnings per shares, you know, as I said earlier, they, they, they've kind of been, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down um, as an industry. But their earnings per shares over the last, you know, five years have, have been fairly steady. It's just been recently that that things have, have kind of fallen. But they've been able to be pretty consistent uh, over time. And they're, they're uh, if you notice, they're, they're are the, they are the black line here. Um, which, you know, is relatively tight with everything else, with the exception of the uh, year 20, um, which they, they seem to have a, a dip from um, from everyone else. Next slide. Five minutes, Melvin. Thank you. When we look at return on equity, uh, the, the return on equity appears to be consistent with the industry. They, they're tracking pretty well with that, uh, with their competitors as far as CVS, uh, Walmart. Uh, are their majors or Rite Aid is, is not really a major player in here. And they're, they're, they're tracking pretty well with the industry average. Next slide. And so debt to capital, it, as you notice that their, their debt, they're carrying a lot more debt than their competitors, but that's because of this new expansion that they're doing as a part of their growth strategy into these healthcare facility, these one-stop healthcare facilities that they're, that they're building um, 600 across the, the U.S. So that's allowing them, that's forcing them to carry probably more debt than everyone else. Next slide. Uh, and then when we look at payout, the payout is for them is, is relatively good. Uh, you know, 37, 37%, which is, you know, slightly, slightly below Walmart there, but they're, the, the payout is not too bad historically. 
Next slide. So when we look at the the current price of 34.34.6, you know, the the closing price was uh 34.5, you know, it is at the very very top of the buy range. The it, uh, it's it's at the very top of the buy range and at the bottom of the whole range. So it's within pennies uh, of a buy. And so the the upside down ratio on this is about 2.8 to 1. So it's it's close. Uh, so if you you're looking at, to uh, to make a short term gain because you can see the target price is still uh, forecast high price is still around fifty five dollars. So could be something to put on your watch list going forward. It could be a sh good short term uh, investment for you. Next slide. The other thing um, that I can talk about here is that the total return, um, if you look at just the analyzed price appreciation of about 10% and an average yield of 3.7, gives you an annualized rate of return of about 13.7, um, which as I said before, is you know about a 2.8 to 2.1 upside down ratio uh, with a closing price of uh, about 34.5. Uh, so, like I said, just uh, just at the very top of the the buy range and at the very bottom of the whole range. So, if you're uh, somebody that wants to look for something short term, this could be a, a stock for you. Next slide. So, Walgreens is a large size, steady growth and income company with a 5.3 percent dividend yield. Uh, it has no moat, uh, which means that it does not possess any structural advantages strong enough to earn excessive returns or generate returns on invested capital above its cost of capital over the next 10 years. Uh, Walgreens has an, is being excellently managed right now. Um, Morningstar considers it to be an undervalued company with a fair market value of $48. So anything below 48 is considered to be a fair market for this, this stock. You know, based on our research, we consider it to be a buy up to about $34.10. Right now, it's trading at about thirty-four dollars and sixty cents, which is about a fifty cents difference. So, you know, we think that's close. That's close enough to continue to be supported as a buy. Thirteen point seven percent total return should be a candidate for a short-term investment of about eighteen months. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Nice job. Glad to have you. Okay, so we went through those, <coughs> uh, and here's here's a summary. So we're going to go back over. Lululemon, uh, Walgreens, Micron, and Enphase. And let's go to our next slide and ask our our panelists here. Uh, Cheryl, we'll start with you. We like to sort of see where this company fits on the life cycle. And why did you pick that location for Lululemon? Um, well, they've, they've been around for some time, um, as I talked about in the history. Um, and and they're really their strength is the fact that they are creating a community uh, rather than just building stores. Um, there's a community system within each of the stores and even with the online. So I would put them right there, you know, close to the line of, of explosive growth and mature growth, just kind of teetering over into mature growth um, because they can, you know, depending on, on what they do in these next couple of years with expansion uh, will really tell the, tail of, of which direction they're going in. Okay. And I put Micron pretty much in the same spot of mature growth. Part of it is because they do go back and, you know, they don't have a moat. Things can really sort of change very, very quickly. But the thing is, is that the area that they're in, in terms of memory and storage for chips, is going to be a huge driver for a lot of the things that we're talking about with next generation technology. So they could be in that same spot in mature growth for a very, very long time. So it, it, there's still a lot of great opportunities uh, with this. And I think there's, uh, there's stuff to take a look at, but it, this is gonna be a wild ride. This is not gonna be for someone who likes a nice, good, uh, straight up and uh, up straight and parallel uh, type of company. Uh, Ed, tell us about why you have that for Enphase. I think Enphase, um, to use a uh, baseball um, uh, analog, I think it is in the third inning of its nine-inning game. Uh, I think it, it has a clear vision for how to provide end-to-end -end capability 
for for its customers, for its installers. Uh, I think that the uh, uncertainty with energy in this country and, and in Europe uh, is enough to give it a lot of potential uh, runway in regards to uh, sales uh, going forward. And Melvin, tell us why you have that for Walgreens Boots Alliance. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, um, as I said earlier, we try to look for companies that are in the, the seller's market and the pharmaceutical industry is a seller's market. They, they get to name their price. However, it's although Walgreens is an established company, what I don't know yet is how well these new health stations that they've invested in the 600 across the US, how well that's going to take. And so I think they're, they're mature. I don't think it's, it's ready for explosive growth, but I think it's going to take time to get the the full effect of all of that all of those new acquisitions in place to see if it if it if it really works out i know that you know we've got an aging workforce and and more people needing health care uh more people needing health services and so um i believe there's a market it's just for just a matter of whether or not the the models that they've set up going forward will be the market that's going to meet the demand okay Thank you very much. Let's go to our next slide, and I think we're ready to have people vote. So we're going to ask you which one, not so much is a buy, but which one intrigues you enough that you want to do some more of your own research on it? And Cheryl will release the poll. And you will get a chance to vote. There it is. Okay, votes are coming in pretty quick. We're just at 50%. Let's see, it doesn't cost anything, it's free. We don't know what you're voting for. We're just about at, see, we're at 70%. <coughs> we get any higher? We're at 75. Can we get up over 80? Maybe one, two. It looks like we're holding off. We might as well just close it out. There we go. We had a very, we had a dead heat between Enphase and Micron. So anyway, um, good job for for uh, again. Thanks to all our panelists for helping out. Let's, uh, uh, Jonathan. Um, where are the questions? Are we still having trouble with the um, um, with people getting the handouts? Yes, um, I think we should address uh, the handout issues. Maybe we can um, again ask people whether or not you're able to see the handouts in the control panel. If not, we're going to have to settle on an alternative solution. Maybe we could email the handouts to those who uh, who have not received them. Yeah. Can you um, open up the mic and let uh, anyone respond whether or not uh, yeah, I think that might be the easiest. If they, if they uh, raise their hand, um, that would certainly help us. Do we have anyone who's... Okay, I, I did ask. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, da, 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 um, I'm going to put in the email that we use for this program. I'll put it into the um, chat. And if you're still having trouble, you can reach me at that email address uh, where we put up the uh, for the YouTube channel, uh, digging in, digging.into.bi at gmail. And uh, we can get to that. But and I, I did see where uh, one person, Sophia, had, had sent me uh, their screen capture. If you can do some of the screen captures, it would certainly help us because in our spot, I can see a lot more because I'm one of the uh, organizers and panelists than what you can. But go ahead and um, uh, let me know um, and the like. It could be something new with uh, the new desktop stuff that. Uh, It'd go to webinar. I don't know, um, but uh, anyway, we will we will find uh, a way to uh, work around. But anyone who is having trouble, you can reach me at that um, um, 
at the digging in digging dot into dot bi at gmail and um again if you can make a screen capture i'd like to be able to see what you're seeing on your screen so therefore when if this happens again and it probably will we'll be able to take a look at it what else do we have anything oh, this is a question for you what was your low pe for mu yeah i went through it because i went too long uh, my high pe forecasted high pe or future pe was high was 13 and my low was six so hopefully that will help and again, if people want to raise their hands, we can unmute you and uh, let you, um, you know, get you into this. Let's see. We've got another question. Oh, this is actually a comment from John Beck. For what it's worth, uh, John apparently wrote the first first cut for Enphase, and he's worked with venture capital-backed startups for most of his career. So he understands how management will do whatever it takes to stay profitable profitable once they have turned profitable. So in phase is the best performer in his portfolio. So okay. Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting comment. I in one of my readings, I found that at least some of the analysts were talking about that N phase might have done a little bit of financial engineering to get to that point of profitability. And I was a little skeptical, uh, although I'm not, not feeling as strong as the gentleman's opinion that he just provided, but it just, it's like dividends. Once you do dividends, you don't want to ever, you know, stop dividends because it's, it really does destroy. So that's, uh, that's interesting and great to hear um, that. It's another comment, uh, Ed, uh, good job digging into Enphase. Good job, everyone, for the fantastic uh, analysis. Uh, two questions for Melvin regarding Walgreens. Um, um, the first one re is, reg both of them actually have to do with um, boycotting and abortion pills. Walgreens, what impact on sales growth will the decision to not sell abortion pills? And then how are boycotts affecting Walgreens um, going forward? I didn't I didn't see anything in the write ups where that was going to be a headwind for them um, going forward. So I, I I'd have to do a little more digging into that. But I didn't see that as a headwind. Their biggest headwind right now is is their competitors and whether or not these investments in because <clears throat> Walgreens, you know, they hadn't they didn't really have the network that CVS and Walmart had. And so now they're they're starting to build that out with these healthcare networks. And so that's that's really the headwind that we're going to see with that is whether people will adopt to these and, and take those on. And that boycotting wouldn't just be for Walgreens. It would also be for CVS and the like. So it'd be the industry as a whole, I would believe. Okay, great. So that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. I did see uh, someone had their hand up. It looks like it's Mary Jo. I think I've unmuted her. So if you want to, you're muted on your side. If you want to click on your microphone, or it looks like you may have just taken your um, hand down. So maybe you didn't want to ask a question. Anything else? I guess not. Um, let's finish up with our last two or three slides. Um, Cheryl, and again, if you see any more questions, go ahead and let us know, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, will do. So we can tell them what's uh, going up next, if we can take down the poll, Cheryl. I'm still seeing oh, the poll. Sorry. So yes, there's a few, yeah, we got it. So there's our email for uh, the digging into the BI. So again, if you're still having trouble with those slides, I did see uh, one person uh, sent me their, um, what they were seeing. Again, up at the top, there's a, in their control panel, there'll be a, a file and I, f I think options and then view. If you click on view, you should be able to see the, and then go down and click on handouts. You should be able to see it. 
But there's our contact information for both the Maryland and D.C. chapter um, and, and the like. And there's some of us that were at the last bank in Dallas. Um, let's go to our next slide. Um, if you want to join our mailing list, uh, we send this out through the D.C. regional chapter. Just come on over to the main page and uh, Carol will not inundate you with those, but she will uh, keep you informed of that, our book club and any of the other educational things that we're doing. Next slide. Um, Jonathan, you want to tell us about volunteering and why it's such a great thing? Although I see we have a lot of directors in the audience, so that's preaching to the choir, but go for it. Preach. Okay. Um, yeah, volunt better investing has been around for over 70 years, and it's been extremely successful primarily due to the volunteers that are actively participating and educating uh, and the individual uh, members. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, thing to do for the organization. It keeps you connected with other like-minded individuals. You can learn new skills. You'll help to educate others. I always say it takes a village and it, it takes a village to educate one another so that we can all be successful. So it's uh, uh, definitely a rewarding aspect, one of the best rewarding aspects of participating with the Better Investing Organization. The DC chapter is also giving out new Teslas uh, for club visits. So you can join the DC chapter and get a new Tesla too. So, so yeah, so everyone consider volunteering. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you. I need to get one of those Teslas. <laughs> Let's go to our next slide. So here's what we're going to be doing in May. Uh, we already, uh, it's uh, Fortinet uh, and Peabody Energy are the stock to study and undervalued feature. We're going to come back to another semiconductor in Taiwan. And then we, we haven't decided what the last one's going to be, but it may be a regional bank, which is really appropriate when you see what's going on right now. So come and join us on May 1st. Um, next slide. Um, also, we have stuff up on Manifest. If you uh, have a subscription or even if you don't, we have a bunch of these uh, uh, dashboards that are up there. And if we go to the next slide, those are all the ones there. You can see all of them, and those are all hyperlinks. Again, you don't have to be a subscriber. We'll uh, I'll update it with uh, another winner that we have here. You, uh, if you know how to use those dashboards, uh, we can do it. And we tend to look, review them when we do our portfolio review si every six months. Next slide. So that's really it. Final slide, that hyperlink again is to the uh, YouTube channel. So come and join us and we look forward to seeing you. One last uh, check, uh, Jonathan, any other questions or queries you, do you see there? No, I do not see any additional questions. Okay. And no hands raised. Well, we did go a little long. Uh, some of us were a little long-winded. We won't mention any names, Kevin. But um, anyway, we're glad to have you. We'll see you next week. And please work on these things so you too can become a better investor. Good night, all.